Yeah. I know. Well, you should you have to. You should, I know, but mine doesn't work either. I don't know. Why. Judy, we should be good. Now it's muted. Okay. Um, do welcome back everybody or welcome to the September 1st board meeting. Do I have a motion to bring us back into public session? Alex, second Doya, all, I guess we're back in public session. Um, I want to start by apologizing to the public. I gather from my own rewatching of last time's meeting uh, that it was really difficult to hear uh, some of the questions we are going to try and do better and speak into the microphone. Uh, we have somebody remote who can wave at us if we are not being heard. Um, there are a couple of uh, things that I want to read to the public before we actually get started. Um, the first one is a um, uh, synopsis of a, a letter that we sent to the town. Um, at the July 6th town board meeting, the developer of the Dromore property and the developer's attorney made a public presentation of the apartment building they proposed to build there. To move forward, the developer needs the town board's approval of their plan, which includes a payment in lieu of taxes known as a pilot. If the town approves the pilot, and the project, the next step for the developer is to seek approval for state funding. The town asked the district whether we would, whether we approved or disapproved of the developer's pilot application. Pursuant to the state's open meeting law, the board held a discussion with legal counsel and learned that under section 577 of the New York State private housing finance law, the authority to approve or disapprove the pilot legally rests solely with the town board. Thus, on August 20th, the district sent a letter to the town advising that the district declined to take a position on the issue. Housing and zoning matters are not within the district's purview and the district does not have the authority to make a determination on the pilot under the applicable law. However, the district provided data to the town to help the town better understand the number of additional students we could expect to see in Edgemont based on the breakdown of apartments in the proposed new development. If the town ultimately approves the proposed development, we look forward to welcoming any new resident students into our schools. All right, so that's the first statement. The second is we've changed slightly the language on the link to uh, that's posted on the on the sorry on the district's website. Um, and I just want to note that we will be taking comments both from people who show up in person. I know that um, there are no uh, community residents here in person today. Um, we will continue to live stream these meetings throughout the year. Um, we will also take comments through a document that has been posted on the district website's uh, sheet that is contains the link to tonight's meeting. Um, there was a problem with the link at the last meeting that was due to the learning curve that I am facing and dealing with some of the technological issues. I have a good training partner. I think I have learned correctly, and hopefully we will not have that problem again. So now, can we move on to the approval of the minutes from August 17th meeting? Um, motion from Marikita, second from Nilesh, all in favor? Okay, it passes unanimously. Um, uh, recognition of community. Um, do you wanna take a questions? Okay. Treasurer's report. Did I skip that? I did, thank you. Okay, let's take the treasurer's report. Is there a motion to approve that? Alec, Marikita, second, all in favor? Thank you, it passes unanimously. 
Now we'll go to recognition of community. Um, Alec, do you want to present the, the question now or? Oh, right. So um, at this time, we only have one entry, but um, as in the past, if there's something that comes in later, we can deal no, no, with it. Microphone. Uh, sorry. Um, right now, there's only one, so I'll, I'll re read that now, but um, we generally, I'll monitor as it comes in, and if we have time to deal with things during the meeting, we'll, we'll take any that come in later. Um, this is from our uh, esteemed former colleague of Hamill Montgomery. And her question is with regard to, to high school, and let me just back up a second. As a general rule, we're taking comments. If there are questions that you know we think we can easily answer within and fit in with sort of the context of what we're doing, you know, we're not gonna automatically knock them out just because they're a question, but um, we, we will not, we can't guarantee that we'll always take questions during the meetings because we need to get our business done. But this question says, with regard to high school athletics, I see that Yonkers and some other school districts are mandating COVID vaccines for all students, coaches, trainers, et cetera. Does Edgemont plan to do the same? So I, I'm actually going to be talking about everything surrounding that, okay. if it's okay, if I can sure. uh, speak to that during the presentation. Of course. Yeah, thank okay. you. Um, and now we come to the acceptance of gifts, but there are none today. Uh, and next is up is the superintendent's report. Victoria? Yes, thank you. Actually, uh, Dr. Michael Curtin will begin and we are going to tag team this presentation. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. And I'm going to uh, share my screen. Uh, oh, um, Brian, would you please enable screen sharing for me? Or someone? <laughs> Working on it. Ah, there we go. It looks like it worked. Um, there we go. <sighs> okay, can you see my slide? Yes. Yep. All right, excellent. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, a new school year. It's, it was great seeing our teachers back and some of our students uh, wandering around campus uh, today and um, happy to beginning uh, a new, um, slightly more normal school year than compared to last year. Um, at the last Board of Education meeting, uh, Victoria spoke about some of the health and safety measures we are taking as we return to school. And um, she'll actually be going back to that in a little while. But tonight I'll be talking about the steps we're taking to support our students transition back to um, learning in the classroom in terms of academics, social emotional learning, and so forth. I'd like to start tonight by just um, um, presenting uh, the preamble to our newly revised district goal. Um, and I thought it, it was useful to start here tonight because um, it so reflects the work I'm gonna be describing in the next few minutes. Um, um, our approach in trying to help students through this transition certainly reflects an awareness of um, a rapidly changing environment, interconnectedness where people watch out for one another, where we rely on one another and uh, an evolving landscape. So, you know, the, the challenge that that district goal kind of articulates, uh, certainly uh, challenges that we've been grappling with for the last 18 months or so. And uh, they, they certainly um, informed our work as we created a plan to help kids transition back into the 2021-2022 school year. Um, I do know that Victoria and other uh, colleagues of mine we will be um, presenting and exploring the district goal and its components um, in greater depth in upcoming Board of Education meetings. So um, we really started talking about what the transition back to um, in-person, full-time in-person learning would look like um, last, last winter and spring. And um, as I kind of reflect back on the many, many, many conversations that we've had um, over that time, I think they really kind of 
coalesce around these three questions that you see here on the board, on, on a slide, excuse me. And uh, tonight's organization, sorry, tonight's presentation will be organized around these three questions. What content and skills did students master and what did they miss during the 2020-2021 school year? Uh, what some people have called the learning gaps. Um, how has the trauma and the disruptions of the 2020-2021 school year impacted our students' capacity to return to normal schooling this year? In other words, on a broad scale, um, what are we expecting in term and how are we going to accommodate that as students come back? And then on a more specific individual scale, how do we support individual at-risk students, especially those who were fully remote for most or all of the last school year? So before I dive into those questions, though, I'd also like to just kind of articulate the assumptions that we've been making as we planned uh, for the return to school this year. Um, coming back to school is going to be an adjustment for everyone, for students, for teachers, for staff, for administrators, for parents. Um, we're all adjusting or readjusting to life uh, that looks significantly different from how it did last year. Um, in the short term, we expect that there are many students that will come back um, who experience some level of challenge, kind of getting reacclimated to a normal school setting and routine. Um, homework might feel a little different, uh, more or less structure or different structure to their day. And we believe that the vast majority of those students will be able to make those adjustments without significant intervention. They have their support structures in place. They know how to ask for help. They're able to monitor their own learning. Our students are resilient and um, if they've learned a lot from the last year. Um, and we're really confident that most of our students will be able to um, readjust to uh, schooling as they return. But we also believe that there are a significant number of students who will require assistance making that transition. And that it's on our whole team from administrators to teacher aides, to teachers, to clerical staff, to kind of intervene and, and find appropriate targeted interventions to help them make that transition. And we believe that absent that level of support, that heightened level of support, absent making those interventions, those students are at risk. And so we're, we're sort of adopting a layered approach where we know that everyone's gonna have some readjustments. We believe that we have to make some global adjustments to kind of smooth that transition out. But then we also know that, that some kids are going to need more and we've worked very hard to identify who those kids are and what we can do to help them. I'd also like to just note finally that it's not all doom and gloom uh, in terms of our assumptions. We assume that last year students learned a lot, um, not just academic content, but mindsets and skills and understandings that they might not have developed in a different school year. Persistence, um, perseverance, problem solving, learning how to advocate for yourself, learning how to organize yourself, learning how to seek help when you need it. So a key assumption is that our kids are coming back with some things that they and we should be aware of and more importantly, proud of, um, and that will serve them well as we make this adjustment. Okay, so now to dive into those three questions. First of all, the question of what some people have called learning loss or learning gaps. Um, certainly last year looked different and the pacing of um, our courses were different at all levels, okay? Things that might have taken two weeks in a previous year took three weeks or four weeks, or maybe they didn't get covered. There are parts of the curriculum that might have been um, scaled back a little bit. There are other areas where perhaps it was taught but not fully understood by some students. So we really have to figure out how to, how to um, provide schooling, especially at the start of the school year that accommodates that. Um, I think there's been a lot in the media about learning loss, and I think that that 
term is inappropriate for what we're going to see. As I mentioned, kids are resilient and um, typical summer slide, they forget a lot of things over the summer. We have a, a curriculum that by and large spirals. And so we revisit topics again and again um, in a way that deepens students' understanding. But um, I'll just highlight two steps that we're taking to kind of um, address this, this need. First of all, um, last year we asked the EHS teachers to um, document the scope and sequence of every single course um, uh, in, at EHS. You see an example of this um, on the right-hand side of this, this slide for the English 11H course. And we really just kind of asked them to outline their, the units that they teach, what are the main questions or topics that they're tackling, and then ordinarily, in an ordinary year, about how long should it take to get through sort of a high level map of the course. But um, Kyle's idea, and I thought it was a great one, was to also include information about how long we spent on it last year. And that's the final column that says recommended pacing 2021. And that information will be available to all of our teachers so that they understand if, if for example, if I'm teaching English uh, 12 honors, I can look at this document and understood which areas we looked at fully, um, which areas maybe got less time, um, and so, and get to give me a sense of where my students are starting as a group. Um, in our elementary school, um, we're gonna continue diagnostic testing. Um, we always do a Fountas and Pinnell assessment, um, which assesses students' reading. We do that uh, sometime during the fall. Um, this year, partly in response to COVID and partly just because we've been talking about it for some time, we're going to introduce a math assessment at the beginning of the year, the Renaissance STAR math assessment. This is an online assessment. Um, it takes, I think, about 30 to 40 minutes to administer. It uses um, a technique called adaptive testing where the kids, if they get a question right, it asks them a slightly more challenging question. If they get it wrong, it stays at the same level. So within a relatively short window of time, you can get a sense for where the kid, the individual student, as well as groups of students, um, where they are strongest and where they need some extra support and review. And so uh, we're really excited to introduce that new assessment, our teachers will be getting training on how to give the assessment um, tomorrow. The second question that's been on my mind and many other people's minds is how have the trauma and the disruptions of the 2020-2021 school year impacted our students' capacity to return to normal schooling this year? So thinking in terms of um, broad, issues that we're seeing across large groups of students. Um, and the way we determined this is um, by, uh, in the spring, we collected data from teachers and we asked them if they had concerns about a student or a group of students to share that concern through an online form. Um, and I'll talk in a few minutes about how we are helping those particular students. But I also asked the, um, the counselors and the psychologists to review those data en masse and to try to tease out what are the things we're seeing again and again? What are the concerns that are coming up again and again? What are the main themes that if we can give teachers some tools right from the start to address those needs proactively, we won't have kids falling through the cracks you know, at the end of the first quarter at the end of the first semester or whatever. And the four broad themes that we identified, you see um, at the bottom of this slide, identifying and addressing learning gaps, um, addressing a broadened continuum of needs, reestablishing community and helping students feel connected and bolstering executive function skills. So um, in tomorrow's superintendent's conference day, we're going to be introducing teachers to a support model and some very specific supports that they can use to address these, these four concerns. Um, most importantly of all, we're really um, emphasizing the importance of building a community in the classroom. Kids cannot learn 
if they don't feel safe and secure and connected. And many of them have been disconnected in lots of different ways um, over the last 18 months. And so we really want to pay attention to making sure that kids' mental health needs are met, that they are connected socially, that they feel safe um, and connected in their classrooms. And we're going to be working with the teachers to help them um, establish that, that sort of warm and welcoming and supportive classroom. Finally, we asked, how do we support individual at-risk students, especially those who are fully remote for most of the 2021 school year? Um, as I mentioned, uh, teachers were invited to um, complete a form where they identified one or more students of concern and um, that they were working with that year. And one of the simplest things we could do with that is to turn those data over to the following year's teacher, which we've done. Um, so if I'm teaching Johnny this year, but you know, um, Victoria had him last year and she had some concerns, I've already gotten a, a notice that kind of outlines that. And also, you know, uh, I now know who his last year's teacher was and I can connect with her and really kind of talk through how to support that student. Um, in terms of the needs of remote only students, um, we, obviously are very concerned about, about bringing them back and helping them to feel comfortable after a year away from campus. Um, each school organized at least one, and in some cases more than one, um, meetings for remote only students that happened over the last few weeks where they could come to campus, um, have a tour, talk to the administrators or counselors or psychologists, and just kind of and, and reconnect with some of the other students. So we felt that that was really helpful in reacclimating those students um, to school. So at this point, um, those are some of the broader steps that we've taken to um, help kids transition back into the new school year. Um, there are some special cases that uh, I'm now going to invite uh, Dr. Newell to discuss about temporary quarantine. I know we're still working on that one and then um, how we're, we're providing for students who are still unable to attend in person. And then I know uh, Victoria is also gonna talk a little bit about um, you know, an update on health and safety concerns. So Victoria, I will turn it over to you. Sure, thanks Mike. Um, so what, what's so interesting about everything COVID is all of the information we get keeps changing. And I wanna just assure everyone that we are having conversations with unions where that is needed and, and moving forward. And we're very excited about our temporary quarantine program. I want to thank the principals for hosting the parent meetings where they answered very specific questions about the school schedules and about what the experience will be like for the students. So the, the temporary quarantine at at both schools will be based on those students who are quarantined by the Department of Health or by a medical professional. And, and those students will, oh, I don't have my camera on. Yeah, yeah, I don't have my camera. Um, so so the, those students um, will be supported at the elementary schools by uh, teaching assistants who have been hired in each school and we're working on the specifics of, of what that process will be. And, and I'll talk a little bit ab about um, the actual quarantine. So at this point, we do not expect as many quarantines at all as last year. The classrooms have all been set up to prevent quarantining. So for example, at the elementary schools, the desks are three feet apart. So for any student who is three feet apart and masked, even if a student tests positive, there would not be a need to quarantine. So that that staticness of sitting next to a student for sitting next to someone for more than 15 minutes is for a 24 hour period is the, um, the metric for whether or not a student would be a close contact. There are, however, some classrooms at the high school where the students won't always be separated by three feet. So if that's the case and they're, and they're fully masked, it's possible that someone might be considered a close contact. If that person is um, vaccinated, 
they would not need to quarantine. So, so at, at the high school, um, I will talk a little bit more about that on, on the next slide, but regarding quarantine, we expect a lot less quarantines. We will have separate plans in place for the K-6 as well as 712, but we will support those students who are quarantined. Um, medical exemption is different. I know there have been a lot of questions. Will we have a remote only program this year? We will not have a remote only program. For any students who are medically unab unable to attend school, they should reach out to the principal. There is an application for homebound instruction for anyone who is medically unable to attend school for this year. Uh, and, and that instruction will likely be provided by a third party organization as, as it is uh, whenever we have a home instruction uh, situation. Um, just double checking on anything else, quarantine. Just one yeah. point of clarification, I know you didn't mean this, but when um, you're talking about quarantining, so if a student who tests positive would quarantine, and it's the close contacts that we would not need to, they would not be deemed close contacts if they followed all the protocols you explained, masked, three feet apart. Thank you very much. Yes, of course, yes. The person who tests positive would be removed from, from the classroom <laughs> and, and, and would be isolated as per, thank you for that, Brian. <laughs> would not want that to be assumed. Um, on the next slide, in terms of vaccinations and COVID testing, So as you know, and this has been said a number of times, as of June, over 80% of the staff were vaccinated. We're currently updating that information. There is no plan to mandate vaccinations for any staff members nor for any students. However, uh, what we do know about our student athletes so far, and, and this was um, just not uploading any evidence, but just reporting vaccination, 89% of them are vaccinated and we will be updating the data. Uh, we'll be sending out consent forms for testing to all parents and for those students who are in the age group to be eligible to be vaccinated, we'll be asking for evidence of vaccination status. The vaccination status will be necessary to know back to determining who the close contacts are. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned previously, for students who are vaccinated, they will not be considered close contacts as easily as those students who are uh, unvaccinated. Uh, but again, the, the elementary schools have more, have more space. So, and the bodies are smaller. So we're able to, to separate them and, and we uh, don't expect them sitting close to each other. Um, in terms of also the COVID testing, we are participating in the Westchester County COVID-19 school screening testing program. Uh, I thought I had so many details and I knew exactly what we were doing. And right before the meeting, I got an email which changed everything. So um, more details will be coming. But what I do know is it's being paid for by Westchester County through a federal grant. I also know that parent consent will be necessary and that we're expected during the week of September 13th to have gateway testing. The idea is to test 100% of people of, uh, again, who give consent. And we are uh, working and, and continuing discussions with our, our bargaining units regarding the, um, the mandatory testing. Uh, also following that gateway testing on 913, we'll continue weekly surveillance testing through December of 20% of people who give consent. Brian, anything to? And just add to that mm -hmm. quick, the um, September through December part, that's just what we know now. It doesn't mean that it might not change in the future. Is that correct? That's correct. That's what we know through this uh, Westchester County program. Yes. So with that, uh, we continue to get updates daily. I will be getting the consent letters out to all parents shortly and uh, We'll keep moving ahead and sharing information as we have it. Any questions, questions. from the board? Alec? Yeah, thank you very much. It's very helpful. Um, my question doesn't directly 
relate to this, but it is under sort of the umbrella of how we support our students. Um, the um, public may or may not know, but every week we in executive sessions with this privilege and information, and even within that, we still don't know specific information about who students are, but we discuss the, um, the needs of the special education students and the services that we're providing to them. And in those discussions, a topic that has come up a few times is the thought of potentially having a um, therapeutic support program within the school. So I was hoping that maybe tonight, since we haven't prepped for anything, we could get the 30,000 foot view, you know, just what does that mean if people understand that? And maybe if we could ask you guys to come back at a later session to maybe do one of these presentations about you know, what might it look like here if we decided to do that. Sure. So I, I think this is a great timing to to look at that and to revisit the needs of our students, because if you think about uh, the 30,000 foot view of a therapeutic support program, it's it's providing the students what they need. It, it's providing students the resources and supports they need, which is is more than we can typically provide in just our, 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 our regular school environment also more flexibility in scheduling. Um, so the, the kinds of things that are necessary just sometimes pre, pre would uh, require an extra space, for example, an extra classroom, uh, maybe some timeout space, extra resources. So yeah, we, we'd be happy to gather information as we're looking at the return and also to come back to the board with some uh, more detailed information and maybe some suggestions. It'd be great, thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. Thank you. Um, yeah, one of the aspects of getting the kids back to school, particularly at the um, junior, senior high school level is the um, you know increased wor workload. I mean, let's be honest, they, they had at maximum six classes every day. Um, so they didn't have homework from nine classes every day. Tests were online. Um, with often much more than a 40 minute period in which to uh, in which to complete them. Um, you know, the, the for some kids, February 2020 was a bit of a pressure cooker. Uh, what are the thoughts about helping just the typical child adjust to what is a real potential for a ramp up in expectations right off the bat after being in this less pressured environment for a year and a half. Mike, can I take a, a stab at it first and then and you go? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so, you know, that, that, that's a great point. And actually we have some survey data from students from last year. So we have some good comparative points to take a look at. I wouldn't say that last year was um, a picnic in terms of students did a lot of work and were very engaged in homework and, and, and so we, we do have some data on that and we can compare because as, as Mike said, we, are, we have been looking at student needs and working with teachers and spending tomorrow particularly on, on um, giving teachers additional tools in, in terms of how to support the students. But um, I think everyone is, is very aware that we are in different times and that this is a big transition. For example, we had an eighth grade orientation this year. That's the first time that has ever happened before. So what we're, we're adding on programs, we're taking steps. We have um, the, the, the whole first few days of school will look very different for seventh and eighth graders, as well as um, the community building that, that Mike uh, mentioned in terms of the attention for, for all teachers. But, but you're right, Jennifer, nine periods are, are more than six periods. Each class meets every day, but we are all very aware of that and do have data that we collected last year that we can continue to collect and, and, and make sure um, th that's one metric. And of, of course, other metrics are how, how the students are doing. Okay. Mike, anything you would wanna add? To, to that or that, that I missed? That beautifully. I have nothing. <laughs> Thank you, Victoria. Any other questions? 
clarifications? Great. Well, can, we'll can we we're certainly to... excited can... about the year because we we believe we know how to do this. We had a successful year last year. We got great kudos from the uh, County Department of Health in terms of this um, uh, controlling the spread at schools. And, and, and we believe that we are very ready and excited about the school year. And do we want to be encouraging people to sign the consent forms for mm. the gateway? Please do, please do. Uh, testing is so important, uh, catching asymptomatic um, cases would certainly be helpful to the health and safety of our entire community. We want to stay in school. Also, I know that pesky easy screen is still here. Um, and once we get our testing program up and running, we will uh, discuss and consider not having easy screen. So um, if you don't like easy screen, sign the consent form and let's, and let's all get tested. Okay. There was a community can I, question. Can I just oh, interject right. very quickly? Go ahead. Um, your mention of easy screen uh, reminded me that unfortunately uh, a reminder to do easy screen that was supposed to be texted to teachers and staff this morning went home to families by mistake. <laughs> and so those will start back up, but not until it's time for the school, the kids to be back in school. So <laughs> my apologies. Um, we're all, like I said, we're all transitioning back and hitting bumps along the way. So I had mine this morning. Join the club. It's okay. <laughs> um, Nilesh raised a point of, we still have Pamela's question to answer. Oh, I, I, did, I, I thought the question was, do we plan on mandating vaccinations? Oh, yeah. Right. Okay. And I, think and I said, no, we, we do not are. plan on mandating okay. vaccinations. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, before I get to the uh, rest of the agenda. Is there any anything that anybody wants pulled out? The retirement, the one retirement. Okay. Uh, yes. Um, hold on. Uh, that would be G seven. No. Um, oh, right. Uh, mm -hmm. G three. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's pull out. Do you want to do GC G3 first? Sure. Uh, John McCabe, are you on? Yeah. Great. Thanks, John. Do you have a few words to say about Hong? Yes. <clears throat> Good evening. Thank you very much. Everyone can hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share a few words of appreciation for our soon to be retired EHS senior custodial worker, Hong Fat Duong, affectionately known to us at Edgemont as Hong. Hong's Edgemont Odyssey began almost 29 years ago to the day on September 10th, 1992. When I arrived the full 13 years later, it didn't take long for me to recognize Hong as a special individual. One of the things I admire most about Hong is that he's the same guy day in, day out, year after year. Of course, that in and of itself is not necessarily going to project a favorable, favorable image, but as it relates to Hong, what I experience on a daily basis is an honorable man who I can trust and depend upon. Hong always maintains a highly cooperative demeanor while fulfilling his cradle to grave approach to his work. We hear a lot about ownership and accountability. For Hong, they are inherent values of his work ethic. Hong has always been one to take pride in his work and go out of his way to be helpful. The positive impact he has had here on the school community became evident when he took it, when he became ill last year. The outpouring of care and support for him was uplifting to say the least. Hong has really touched a great many people in a positive way here at Edgemont and that legacy will remain with us for a long time to come. Please join me in thanking Hong for his faithful service to the school community he has been a longstanding cornerstone of the custodial unit, and I appreciate his selfless commitment to the school district during an admirable career. I wish Hong and his family a lifetime of good health, happiness, and prosperity as they embark on the next chapter together. Thank you, Mr. Hong. Thank you, John. Okay, so um, I take that one separate? Yes. Now? 
I'd like to ask the board's approval of the resignation of Hung Fat Duong, senior custodial worker, Edgemont Junior Senior High School for the purpose of retirement. Do I have a motion? Marikita, second, Doya, uh, all in favor. It is unanimous and we wish Hung e e enormous good health and good uh, rest, <laughs> well earned. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so now we have the rest of the agenda. Do you want me to? Sure, I can, I can. Okay. Got my computers up and running here. I'd like to ask the board's approval of G personnel one, two, and then four through 32. H students, I business, numbers one through five. Do I have a motion? Alec, second, Nilesh, all in favor? Uh, it is unanimous. Great, thank you. Uh, we have um, schedule of meetings. The um, sorry, the, the next the next meeting will be on se uh, September fourteenth at seven p.m. At the moment, we are still planning on meeting here in the library. Um, if that changes, it will be posted. The following meeting, and that will be at 7, uh, at 7 p.m., moving immediately into executive session, and then the public session will begin at 8 p.m., uh, and the same schedule holds true for September 28th. Um, and Judy, I just want to note on, on the um, minutes, it says 928 is still if needed, but I believe we can confirm that that will be needed now. Correct. 928. Okay, uh, did, uh, yep. October 12th or we're not uh, up to that? Yeah, um, it's not showing up on it's, uh, Yeah, October 12th. Okay, when we're, and the, the next, the meeting after the 28th will be October 12th, also with the same schedule, 7 p.m. and entering exec and then going to public session at 8 p.m. Uh, do I have a motion to adjourn? Uh, Monica, second the lash, all in favor, and we are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.